Hello everyone, my name is Tan Chuan Singh. I'm a professor in the School of Electrical and Electronics Engineering at NTU. It is my honor today to introduce the plenary speaker, Professor Jayan Balinga, the Progress Energy Distinguished University Professor at the North Carolina State University. Professor Baliga received his BTEC from IIT Madras in 1969 and his PhD from Lanseria Polytechnic Institute in 1974. And he has had a long distinguished career at General Electric before joining NC State. His most impactful innovation was the invention, development and commercialization of the insulated gate bipolar transistor IGBT. He's a recipient of numerous awards, and let me highlight a few. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering at a very young age of 45. He received the Medal of Honor, which is the highest recognition by IEEE. He received the National Medal of Technology and Invention by then President Obama, and he was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. The topic of his plenary presentation is IGBT from invention and commercialization to global social impact. With that, let us welcome Professor Baliga. So thank you for that nice introduction. So in my presentation, I will talk about the IGBT device. I'll take you all the way from the invention and commercialization of the device to its uh, enormous global social impact in this presentation. Next. So since most of you are not familiar with power semiconductor devices or power electronics, I'll start with a very simple example that happens every day in your life. When you throw a mechanical switch in your house, you turn on a power source and then the power flows and turns on a lamp. So we like to do the same thing with power electronics. So next, it shows uh, the mechanical switch and the next shows the electronic switch. So we can do this with an electronic switch at a much, much higher speed at 100,000 times per second. And by doing that, we can do digital power control. And this has enabled us to get tremendous increase in the efficiency for delivering power from sources. Next, in order to achieve this, we want the power to flow from the source to the load without any of this power being consumed by the switch itself. So that is how we get a high efficiency. And in order to achieve this, the power switch has to have certain properties that are listed here. The first is low on-state voltage drops so that we don't burn any power while the current flows through the switch. Next is we want high switching speed to do uh, minimization of power losses and to improve the circuit performance. We need the devices to work at high current density so that we can make the chip size small and very low in cost, which is beneficial to consumers. And then for all of us, we would like our appliances to last for a very long time, which means we want reliable operation and that requires the switch to be very rugged. Next. So to make you understand how the switch performance has changed over the years, I'd like to trace the evolution of power semiconductor devices on this slide. And I put the slide, switch requirements at the bottom of the slide to remind us of what we are trying to achieve. Next. So you can see here the early power devices were bipolar transistors introduced by the industry in 1950. These devices were used for a while, but they, had, they were not voltage control devices and they had poor switching performance and not very good ruggedness. Next. So in the 1970s, the industry introduced the power MOSFET. This device is a voltage control device with very high switching speed and excellent ruggedness. And this is widely used even today, but it could not handle high power levels. So you find this device in places like your personal computer in the power supply and for lower power applications. So to use uh, devices in higher power applications, such as appliances in your home or 
in electric cars or in locomotives, uh, I decided to invent a new device next. This is a device that I named the IGBT, which was invented in 1980. And it combined the physics of the bipolar transistor with the MOSFET for the first time. Next, the device was very rapidly commercialized by me by taking it from concept to product in less than 10 months. And this is a very unusual occurrence because in industry, it normally takes many years, three, four, five years to bring a new idea into the marketplace. The patent for this was issued to me in 1990 after GE filed for the invention in 1980. But in the meantime, it was very rapidly adopted at GE for a large number of applications because GE was such a diverse company and they built the first heat pump drives, the first uh, innovative lighting, appliance controls, medical devices, and so on using this device. Next. But to achieve this, the, it was not easy. And since you are mostly young engineers who are aspiring to get into a new field, I want to point out that creating a new idea comes with a lot of difficulty. So let me share some of the problems that I had to overcome in order to make this device successful. So the first problem I had to overcome is that inside this device, there is something called a parasitic thyristor shown in the red box. And skeptics believe that this parasitic thyristor would destroy the performance of the device, preventing it from being functional. So I had to add some new innovations, such as uh, the deep P plus region, which is in one of my patents for, issued in 1984. And with that, I could move the latch up current density to a very high level, well above the normal operating range, making this device functional. Next, after I achieved that, the skeptics felt that this device would have very limited use because it would switch too slowly for most applications. So if you are running appliances off a 50 hertz or 60 hertz source, the device can switch slowly and that's acceptable. But if you want to make an adjustable speed drive or an electric vehicle drive, the device should be able to switch at 10,000 hertz or maybe 20,000 hertz. And to do that, it was necessary to do what we call lifetime control. And at the time I invented this device, there was no known process to do such lifetime control for a MOS control device. So I had to create a unique uh, process with which I discovered with a post electron radiation anneal to solve the problems of the electron radiation damage. And th without this, we would not have the kind of devices we have today. Next. The other thing I showed in the early days was that this device had excellent high temperature operation. And this was documented in numerous papers that I published. The importance of this is that in most applications, such as in your automobile, uh, the environment is very hot under the hood of the car. So if you want to use this device for ignition control, it has to tolerate that high temperature ambient. Another place where this happens is in the base of a compact fluorescent lamp, which is shown in the middle of the slide on the right-hand side. In fact, G even used this to control steam irons where the device had to tolerate the heat coming from the base of the iron when you're ironing clothes. So this was a very important uh, discovery in order to make this device highly uh, application dominant and to be used in a large number of applications. Next slide. So this is a, shows you a historical milestone where GE announced a product in June 1983 with a data sheet shown on the left-hand side. At that time, in the early days, we called this device the IGT, Insulated Gate Transistor, uh, which was later renamed Insulated Gate Bipolar Transistor, or IGBT. And uh, this device won a prestigious award from the Electronics Products Magazine as product of the year. We also published an important paper in a conference to describe how this works so that the people in industry would begin to use this device for many applications. Just as a historical note, this is about two years before companies in Japan and Europe began to create IGBT products. Next slide. Another important thing we showed in the early days, in the early 1980s, 
is that the device structure could be used to scale up the voltage rating very rapidly. This is important because if you scale up the voltage rating, the device is able to be used for many, many more applications. So if you have a device that works only up to 1,000 volts, it may be OK for electric cars, but it cannot be used for electric locomotives or for power distribution systems. So being able to scale up the voltage to the 6,000 volt level, as shown in this chart, for the planar gate asymmetric device and later with silicon carbide to 15 kV devices is important for expanding its applications. Next. So because of this ability to scale the voltage and to also parallel chips to make power modules with higher current handling capability, we could get an exponential growth in the power handling capability as well. And that was very important because the device could then be used in bullet trains like the Shinkansen bullet train in Japan or any other high-speed train around the world. It is even used today for ship propulsion and power distribution systems. Next. So uh, the device today is used in practically all sectors of the economy. Next. In the consumer sector, you use it in your home for flat uh, cooktops for all your small appliances, for your washing machines, for your microwave oven. It is used in the transportation sector to make electric cars, which I'll be talking about more in this presentation. It is used, as I said already, in high-speed bullet trains. In the medical sector, it is used in X-ray machines, CAT scanners, MRI machines. All the power supplies are based on IGBTs. And one of the interesting applications that developed was the portable defibrillator using IGBTs and that is saving more than 100,000 lives every year just in the United States. It is used in the financial sector to make UPS systems for very uh, reliant, reliable uh, financial transactions. And then in the lighting sector, it was used to create the CFL lamp, which I'll be again discussing later in the presentation. In the industrial sector, it's used a lot for motor control and in particular for robotics. And then in this presentation, I want to talk to you about how it is used also in the renewable energy sector, which is very important if we want to mitigate carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Next. So I borrowed this concept from a paper by Kintish. Next, he says that to get improved living conditions, we need to provide people with more goods and services, but this results in more energy consumption which of course causes more carbon dioxide emissions that increases carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that of course results in global warming and climate change, which of course degrades the ecosystem. So we are not able to improve our living conditions under this scenario. Next, we can break this problem by doing conservation, which means using less goods and services, but that's not very popular among people. So instead, what we need to do is deliver these goods and services with greater efficiency, and we need to use renewable energy sources in place of uh, fossil fuels. Otherwise, we would have to do carbon sequestration to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions or do geoengineering. And eventually, if none of this works, then we have to do adaptations, such as building high seawalls to prevent the ocean from entering into our cities. In this presentation, I want to talk to you about the impact of how we have improved efficiency to solve some of these issues. So next. So in terms of IGBTs, we have an, obtained great improvements in efficiency in three areas that I'll highlight in this presentation. First is efficient air conditioning and refrigeration. The second is efficient lighting. And the third is efficient transportation. Next. So here we'll begin by talking about transportation. You can see here various modes of transportation and the percentage of fuel that is consumed by these modes. Next. So you can see that about the internal combustion engine in automobiles for trucks and cars consumes about 80% of the fuel around the world. Unfortunately, burning one gallon of gasoline produces 19.4 pounds of carbon dioxide emitted into the atmosphere. So one of the important things we need to do is to reduce consumption of gasoline. Next. So to understand how we can do this, let's go back to how cars were originally built. 
by using the Kettering ignition system. This is a mechanical system that has been used for many, many decades. It is the basis for driving the spark plug in your internal combustion engine cars. And that is done by using a distributor, which is a mechanical system where something rotates and makes contacts to the various spark plugs. But when the spark plug is ignited, it also causes a arc flash in the distributor, and that wears out the distributor, causing poor timing, and you have to do constant tune-ups. And even with that, the fuel efficiency is not very good. So the next slide shows how a great improvement was made possible by replacing that distributor by using electronic ignition systems with IGBTs. So here the IGBT is being used to control the current flow through the ignition coil and deliver it to the spark plug. But what we can do with the IGBT is electronically control both the current and the voltage. And this wave shaping allows much more efficient use of the fuel inside the internal combustion engine. Next. Uh, today, many companies produce IGBTs just for this one application and billions of IGBTs have been sold by numerous companies, including Fairchild that I've illustrated here. Next. So to understand the impact of this on society, let's take a look at how much gasoline we use. And I'll focus today on the worldwide numbers. So you can see at the top of the chart that in the world, we are using approximately 600 billion gallons of gasoline every year. And this has sort of flattened out in year 2015. So I can extend the data out to 2020 by using the numbers in 2015. Next. So if you uh, take the information that fuel, the inter electronic ignition system improved fuel efficiency by at least 10%, you can then calculate how much gasoline savings was produced uh, from this chart. And it works out to be an enormous number of 1.79 trillion gallons during the 30 year time frame from 1990 to 2020. Next. So as I said already, burning one gallon of gasoline produces 19.4 pounds of carbon dioxide. So if we don't consume the gasoline as pointed out in the previous slide, then we also eliminate carbon dioxide emissions and that is calculated on this slide. So it shows that every year we have been now reducing carbon emissions by about 1,200 billion pounds. And we can then add that up over the 30 year time frame. next from 1990 to 2020. And it amounts to a very large number of 34.7 trillion pounds of carbon dioxide not being emitted into the atmosphere because of the electronic ignition system using IGBTs. Next. Now turning our attention to air conditioning and refrigeration, uh, I want to point out that motors are very prevalent in our society and consume about two thirds of all the electricity that is delivered in the world. And this DOE report next shows that for the uh, residential sector, we use this extensively in our refrigerators and heat pumps. Next, in our commercial sector, it is used for vending machines and unitary air conditioners, which are basically large air conditioners for buildings. Next. So the old technology by which this was done was to take the input AC power that you receive in your homes. In the United States, that's at a fixed frequency of 60 hertz. And in other parts of the world, it may be 50 hertz. But that is then fed into an induction motor, which is very efficient, 95% efficiency. But once you feed this into the induction motor, it rotates at a fixed frequency. And that cannot be fed into loads, such as fans or pumps where you want to regulate the load, change the amount of uh, air that's blowing or the amount of uh, liquid that's being pumped. So in order to regulate that, people were using dampers, but dampers convert the energy that's not used into heat. So this is a very poor in terms of efficiency and the efficiencies obtained were less than 50%. Next. So the new technology that we developed at GE was the adjustable speed drive technology based on IGBTs. Here, as you can see in the lower left, we take the AC input power and then we use the adjustable speed drive containing IGBT switches to produce power at a variable frequency. 
So instead of having the fixed 60 hertz frequency coming in uh, to the home, we are now able to convert that to a variable frequency, which can be anywhere from 60 hertz upwards to even 20,000 hertz. And we feed that into the induction motor and it then spins in proportion to that new frequency. And that then is a, allows us to apply it to the load and obtain various functions at the load level. So since we eliminate the use of dampers, the efficiency of the system improved by more than 40%. Next. So to illustrate what we did, uh, I found some slides from 1983 in my archives. It shows the first IGBT built for ASDs using my design in 1983 at the top and the first commercial adjustable speed drives with a motor at the bottom. Next. So to understand the impact of this, we have to look at how much electricity is used in the world. And in 2014, it was 25,000 terawatt hours. In 2020, it grew to about 26,000 terawatt hours. But from 1990 to 2015, there was a steady growth in the amount of electricity consumed. So if we assume that two thirds of this electricity is used to run motors, and we get a 40% power savings by using adjustable speed drives, then you can calculate the power savings. Now I've shown three scenarios here, one with 25% adaptation or penetration of ASDs in the market, another with 50%, and the last with 100%. Now adjustable speed drives cost more than the old technology. So <clears throat> a lot of uh, people are not willing to pay for this technology because of the initial higher cost. So today, 50% of motor drives are built using adjustable speed drives, but with the right uh, incentives, it is possible to shift that closer to 100%. Next. So if you assume this, these conditions, then we can calculate the cumulative worldwide energy savings for the case of 50% penetration from the year 1990 to 2020, and it turns out to be a very large number of 73,000 terawatt hours. Next. To understand the impact of this on carbon emissions, we have to appreciate that most of our electricity is produced using fossil fuels as shown on the right-hand side. In that chart, it shows that using coal and natural gas, 68% of the electricity is produced around the world. Now, we also know that when we produce this electricity with fossil fuels, we produce 1.1 pounds of carbon dioxide for every kilowatt hour. So using this data, we can convert the energy use into carbon dioxide emissions. So that is calculated and shown on this slide. And what I've shown here is the amount that is reduced by the use of adjustable speed drives because of the improved efficiency by 40%. Next. So if you take this chart and calculate the cumulative worldwide carbon dioxide reduction from 1990 to 2020, it turns out to be about 80 trillion pounds if you take the 50% penetration scenario. Next. Now turning to the case of lighting, uh, for a very long time, we relied on the incandescent lamp, which is a relic of the Edison era. In this technology, we heat a filament to about 3000 degrees centigrade, at which point it emits light. But oh, less than 5% of the energy is actually converted into light. The rest of it is converted into heat. As we all know, the bulb gets extremely hot. In addition, this uh, technology has a fairly short lifespan, but consumers like this approach because it's inexpensive and considered disposable. Next. However, because of the inefficiency, lighting consumes about one-fifth of the electricity used in the world today. Next. To improve upon this, we had to make a shift to the compact fluorescent lamp. This was initially done by work done at GE in the 1980s using IGBTs to create new types of lamps, which they named Triad and Halock, which eventually became the compact fluorescent lamp or CFL. The challenge making a CFL is that the electronics has to be very compact and must fit in the base below the uh, tube of the compact fluorescent bulb. And then you can make a bulb that can screw into your regular lamp sockets. And because the electronics is close to the uh, tube, uh, there is a lot of heat generated, and so it must be able to tolerate heat as well. 
So you need very compact power electronics, which can tolerate heat, which as I explained before, is something made possible by using IGBTs. So using this approach, we are now able to build compact fluorescent lamps, which are 75% more energy efficient. In other words, a 60 watt equivalent lamp only consumes about 13 to 15 watts of electricity with a CFL. In addition, these CFLs have long lifespans, which I, of course, like and all consumers like because you don't have to change your bulb often. Next, to see the impact of this, let's look at how many bulbs are in use. The technology grew in volume in the 1980s rather slowly, but a lot of uh, countries put in incentives for adaptation of this technology. For example, in Japan, by 1996, 80% of households were using CFLs. In India, they put in a project to install 400 million of them. In China, 800 million CFLs were sold even way back in 2007. As a consequence, the number of CFLs in use has grown rapidly after year 2005. And today, next, we have uh, worldwide 22 billion CFLs in use. So let's look at how this has improved uh, the uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Next. So to understand that, we can convert a CFL usage for six hours per day and a energy savings of 45 watts for a 60 watt bulb, and then calculate the power savings. And you can see that uh, the power savings by 2015 has risen to 1,000 gigawatts. Next. And what this means is that the energy savings have grown from 1990 to 2020 to 59,000 terawatt hours. Next. As pointed out before, for the case of adjustable speed drives, most of the electricity is produced using fossil fuels, which emit 1.1 pounds per kilowatt hour. So we convert that for the case of CFLs and find that the uh, global carbon dioxide reduction has reached about 2.5 trillion pounds by 2015. Next. So if you add all this up over the time frame from 1990 to 2020, the cumulative carbon dioxide reduction comes out to be about 66 trillion pounds. Next. So here's a summary of uh, the impact of this technology from 1990 to 2020. And I've listed the numbers for the gasoline and energy savings achieved. What I did not go through is a calculation of the cost savings, which are documented in some of my publications. But by using the cost of gasoline and the cost of electricity, you can calculate the numbers on the right-hand side column. And you can see that not only have we reduced energy and gasoline consumption, but consumers have actually saved a huge amount of money, $33.6 trillion, because they did not have to use as much gasoline and electricity. Next slide. So the worldwide utilities uh, also did not have to construct coal-fired power plants, and they cost about four trillion, uh, sorry, three billion dollars for a one gigawatt power plant. So by not having to construct thirteen hundred and sixty-six power plants, they have saved four trillion dollars. Next, but probably most importantly, worldwide consumers have saved. $33.6 trillion by not consuming 1.79 trillion gallons of gasoline and 133,000 terawatt hours of electricity. Next. In terms of carbon dioxide emissions, I already talked about the numbers on the right-hand side. And if you add those up, it comes out to be 181 trillion pounds over the time frame of 1990 to 2020. Let's put this in context. So next. So let's uh, go to the next. So total uh, global carbon dioxide emissions per year in the world amounts to 80, 000, sorry, 8,000 pounds per person multiplied by 7 billion people in the world. The 8,000 is the carbon footprint for an average person in the world. And that amounts to 56 trillion pounds. What this means is that global activity by human beings is producing 56 trillion pounds of carbon dioxide each year. Next. So what the IGBT has done with the electronic ignition system, adjustable speed drives, and compact fluorescent lamps is to offset carbon dioxide emissions 
for due to human activity over a three-year time span. And this is, of course, over a 30-year duration. Next. Now I want to talk to you about future opportunities to improve things for mankind. The first is to deploy renewable energy sources. And this is, of course, being done by two methods. The first is illustrated here, which is solar. As you can see from the chart, solar deployment has been growing very rapidly, which is very good to see. Next. So this is done either in the form of solar farms, which are large power generating stations, or even rooftop solar panels in homes and businesses. Next. All of these are done by converting the DC power produced by the solar panels into the AC power required to be fed into the grid by using IGBTs as shown in the inverter circuit. So what the IGBTs do is to convert the solar power, which is DC, into the well-regulated 60 hertz power that can be used by consumers and industry. Next, let's take a now a look at wind power. Wind power has also grown rapidly in the last few years, particularly from year 2000, as shown by the chart on the left-hand side. Next, in the case of wind power, the source of energy comes from the wind turbine. As it rotates due to the flow of wind, it produces uh, electricity through a generator. But that is a variable frequency AC power that varies during the day, in the night, depending upon how hard the wind blows. To be able to use this electricity, we have to convert it again into a well, well, very well regulated 60 hertz AC power. And that's done by using IGBTs as shown in the left-hand side. The advantage of using the IGBT-based inverter was it eliminated the gear train and that greatly reduced the weight and size, allowing all the electronics to be located at the top of the wind, uh, wind tower nacelle. Next. Uh, there's an interesting quote here from Electronic Design Magazine going all the way back to 2004, which said that the progress within IGBT technology has made the biggest single contribution to wind turbine advances over the past several decades. So having these IGBTs has been crucial to the success of wind power. Next. Now I want to turn our attention to other opportunities, in particular to transportation. And that is in the case of hybrid electric and electric cars, which all use IGBTs for the uh, designs. So one of the earliest examples of hybrid electric car was the Toyota Prius. In this car, the IGBT is used as shown in blue for the electronic ignition system of the internal combustion engine. And then it is also used in the inverter in red for delivering power from the battery. So you can see in this chart, it is, can be used in the electric only mode or the hybrid electric mode, or it can be used to charge the battery. And it can be even used for regenerative braking, which is very important for getting better fuel efficiency. Next. Today, almost all manufacturers have committed to making electric cars. In fact, many of them have committed to completely going from internal combustion engines to all electric cars by 2035. To make this successful, however, it is important that we deploy a large number of charging stations. But these charging stations should not be powered by uh, fossil fuels. They need to be powered by renewable energy sources. Next. So if we do this, then you can see that we've been consuming 600 billion gallons of gasoline, and we can eliminate all of that. So next. And if we are successful in doing that, then we can reduce annual carbon dioxide emissions by 11.6 trillion pounds, which would be tremendously advantageous. Next. In the case of adjustable speed drives, we can provide incentives to move from the 50% penetration to 100% penetration. And this will, again, greatly improve carbon dioxide emissions. Next. So next, yes. So you can see here that by shifting to 100%, we can reduce carbon emissions by 3.5 trillion pounds each year. Next. And finally, if you take a look at uh, electricity use, as I said before, we are using about 25,000 terawatt hours of electricity. Next. If we 
take all of this uh, electricity that is produced, 68% of that comes from fossil fuels, which is 17,000 terawatt hours. So if you take all of that and we convert it into uh, renewable energy, then we could save carbon dioxide emissions of 19 trillion pounds. Next. So to come to a, the end of my presentation, I'd like to give you some takeaways. First, uh, power devices, in particular IGBTs, have already made a very large impact on efficient utilization of energy in all sectors of the economy. Carbon dioxide reduction achieved over a period from 1990 to 2020 is 181 trillion pounds. The IGBTs also play an essential role in all renewable energy, power generation, and are critical components for hybrid electric and electric cars. So we have a future where we could reduce carbon dioxide emissions tremendously by going to 100% electric vehicles, 100% adjustable speed drives, and 100% renewable energy generation. And this could reduce annual carbon dioxide emissions by 34 trillion pounds. So my message is that we have technology and we have the know-how to make big impact on reducing carbon dioxide emissions to mitigate global warming. It is a matter of proper investment and proper political strategy around the world to make a commitment to making this happen. So I hope you found this story inspiring because it shows how a single technology developed a long time ago in 1980 by me can have such a huge impact on all sectors of uh, humanity and improve the quality of life at the same time providing cost savings and having environmental impact. So thank you for your attention. So now it is time for question uh, for our uh, young scientists uh, out there. And uh, there's one question that I really like because this is my question actually. And it, I think in your talk, uh, Professor Baliga, you mentioned about sketchbooks twice at least. So the question really is that, um, how do you deal with skeptics, okay? So can you hear me? Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. okay, so yes, uh, of course uh, you have to overcome skeptics by the strength of your ideas and uh, you have to be a, a very good salesman, not only a scientist, but someone who can make a compelling argument to your uh, skeptics that it is possible to overcome their objections. Uh, but it takes a lot of conviction, meaning you have to, first of all, believe in your idea very uh, strongly and have done enough groundwork to have the facts straight so that you can overcome these objections. But uh, I, I can mention something interesting. Uh, I like to quote Arthur C. Clarke, who is a famous writer who wrote 2001 Space Odyssey, uh, which became a very famous movie. But he's also known for creating the ge geosynchronous satellites. Uh, that was his idea, and it was implemented, and we use it for communication today. But he said that uh, when you propose any new idea, uh, there will always be people saying it is impossible. And then once you show that it is possible, They'll say, oh, well, maybe it's not worth doing. We'll just keep doing what we are doing. And then finally, when you show that it really works well, they said, oh, yeah, yeah, that was my idea after all. That's why it works so well. So be prepared for th that kind of uh, response. But you know you have been fully successful when other people start taking credit for the work you have done. So I hope this is useful for uh, Elwin uh, Jia. Uh, so the next question uh, actually uh, is a combined question from uh, two audience. Uh, it's actually from uh, Hafiza and uh, Sri Kunal. And the question really is that you have covered a lot of application about IGBTs in our modern life. Uh, I can mention a few consumer electronics, uh, energy, lighting, transportations. Uh, would you be able to comment on the application of IGBT devices for medical as well as the IoT sectors? Okay, so in the case of medical, one of the places which I was very surprised to see the IGBT used was to create the portable defibrillator. So if you're not familiar with this, this is a small laptop size unit that uh, people have now created. And inside that, uh, it is a very highly automated 
system so that if someone is suffering cardiac arrest, you can quickly get this defibrillator from a box in your building or it is now deployed in all the airplanes. So even when you're flying, you can quickly grab this box and you can then respond to the person having cardiac arrest. Uh, in the case of victims of cardiac arrest, you must respond within 10 minutes to save a person's life. So it's very important that this be in close proximity. So that is only possible if these were highly portable, of course, and it became possible only by using IGBTs because when you do the shock, it is a very high voltage, 2000 volt biphasic shock that's given to the cardiac arrest victim and only the IGBT could handle it. So that was a surprising innovation for me because I developed it to run motors or lighting and so on. Uh, let me mention that it is everywhere in the medical systems when you go to the hospital, like x-ray machines in the power supplies. It is used in MRI machines, in CAT scanners. Uh, so it is very much prevalent in medical systems. If you get an ultrasound, perhaps you've had a baby and you wanted to see the image of the baby before the baby was born. That's an ultrasound system where the IGBT is used to control the transducer. So yes, it is uh, very prevalent. Uh, I should mention that I've written a book on the IGBT, which uh, came out in 2015. And if you're interested in details of all of this, it's uh, explained in a 700 page book. So please get that book if you're interested. Okay, fair enough. Uh, the next question is from um, JJ. Okay. Now, his question is that um, Is there any more room left? Okay, for um, advancement and performance improvement in IGBT devices. So the IGBT was a huge quantum leap in performance, as you just heard, and it was revolutionary because it combined two different kinds of physics, MOS physics and bipolar physics. And we made this out of the traditional silicon material. But curiously, I invented this in 1980, as you heard from my presentation. But that same year, it, must, it was a very good year for me. I also created something known as the Baligas figure of merit. This is an equation quoted by everybody now. It was an equation I derived based on theoretical principles that showed that if you change from silicon material to wide band gap semiconductors, in particular silicon carbide and gallium nitride, then we could improve performance by not just 10 times, which is huge, but by 1,000 times. Okay, so it was an enormous prediction that we could greatly improve performance. So yes, there is a way to improve performance. However, the material was not ready. The quality of the material was poor. The size of the wafers was small. So we could not uh, go from the concept, the idea to products very quickly. So it has taken about 30 to 40 years of work to bring the material up to the quality we need. And that has finally happened in about 2010 and silicon carbide products have started appearing in 2010. And the big challenge for us since that time is to bring down the cost of the silicon carbides because it is not enough to have performance. We need also reasonable cost to have a solution for the industry. So I've been working on this at the Power America Institute, which was founded through uh, funding by President Obama back in 2015. And in that institute, I have created the national United States process for making silicon carbide devices at a foundry. And we are successful in making devices there. A number of companies have also created their own processes and are producing devices there. So we expect this technology to become more and more prevalent. And it won't completely replace the IGBT because it's such a good silicon device and its cost is very low. But for some applications where performance is also important, uh, higher performance is needed, then the silicon carbide devices will indeed start getting used. Okay, very good. So this is the next question from uh, Yamuna. I think uh, it's a, basically it's a dilemma that most, uh, I think, young researchers are in. So the question really is about, as a young researcher, should you be focusing more on uh, um, new concepts or should you be focusing more on product development? So, Any advice? Yes, so it's always better to get into a new area where new concepts can be developed because it's very fertile ground. You can do that uh, original work and publish papers and 
hopefully develop a good reputation. Uh, but let me just say that in my own case, when I joined GE, uh, it is not, I did not want to work on power devices because they were already 25 to 30 years old. And I thought everybody had already done things in power devices that could be conceived of. Uh, but that was the only job I was able to get. So I was forced to work in that area. And fortunately, I was able to create all these new ideas like the IGBT and many others, which we haven't talked about because I have a uh, hundred plus patents. So, uh, but those ideas helped transform the power electronics field, transform the power semiconductor field. So it was still possible, even though it was fairly mature to make another big quantum leap in performance. And we're still doing that with the wide band gap materials. So I wouldn't discourage you completely from going into a mature field. If you're brilliant uh, and have ideas, you can still make a contribution, but it's easier if you can uh, go into a new area. Let me uh, answer the other part of your question, which is that when you're doing these innovations, my personal view is that you should keep an eye on product and impact on consumers and humanity. Uh, so the best work you can do is if whatever you innovate actually comes and gets used by people in the world and benefits people. So for me, the greatest satisfaction has been that a device like the IGBT has had so much impact on people as we went through in my presentation. So hopefully you can, each of you can come up with these uh, novelties and improve things for humanity. Yeah, I hope that's useful. So maybe we'll go to the last question about, you know, future density scaling for IGBT devices. So Chua Wu basically proposed an idea of going 3D uh, stacking, but he also worried about uh, heat dissipation. Do you have any comments on, on this idea? So the way we do it with the IGBT is because it has low on-state voltage drop and high current density, we are able to make small chips and you have to be able to remove that heat. And there is now very mature packaging technology to allow us to do that. And we can parallel lots of these chips to get to high current levels. Uh, but that's now become fairly mature. So if you go to silicon carbide, we need to rethink that and improve the packaging just for silicon carbide as well. And there we are also moving up in frequency. So it's not just heat removal. We have to worry about electrical parameters like stray inductance. Otherwise, you get all kinds of problems. So yes, uh, packaging, et cetera, is very important in our area. And uh, we continue to make great enhancements in that area as well. Okay, I guess that is uh, all the time we have for Q&A. Um, but I hope this talk um, have, uh, have inspired all the young scientists out there. Okay, uh, so that you can inspire, you, you can inspire yourself to be the next uh, leaders in, in, in research. So on, G on behalf of GYSS, uh, let me uh, thank uh, Professor Baliga for your very insightful uh, sharing. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you.